Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Britain's outgoing ambassador to the European Union, Sir Ivan Rogers, has strongly criticised the government's preparations for Brexit. In his resignation letter, he said he didn't know what ministers' negotiating objectives were and called on his colleagues to challenge what he called model thinking. Our diplomatic correspondent James Landale reports. Sir Ivan Rogers has been Britain's ambassador to the EU for three years and his criticisms about the government's preparations for Brexit will be hard to ignore. In his resignation email, he says there's a short supply of serious multilateral negotiating experience in Whitehall. And he says the structure of the UK's negotiating team needs rapid resolution. He reveals that even he does not know what the government's negotiating objectives for Brexit will be. But it is Sir Ivan's implicit and thinly veiled criticism of ministers that is most telling. He urges his fellow officials never to be afraid to speak truth to power and to challenge what he calls muddled thinking and ill-founded arguments. He says they should support each other in difficult moments when they have to deliver messages that are disagreeable to those who need to hear them. So Sir Ivan's charge is a serious one, that the government is not ready for Brexit and it is ignoring the advice of its diplomats. James Landau, BBC News. Well, let's go live to Westminster and to our political correspondent, Ian Watson. What will be the reaction to this e resignation email then? I think there's been widespread uh, reaction uh, this morning, actually, in Victoria, on a number of um, a number of fronts. First of all, uh, Leave campaigners, such as the former cabinet minister, uh, Ian Duncan Smith, is effectively saying, look, was it possible for the government really to trust Sir Ivan Rogers? If you look at the manner of this uh, letter, what he was talking about, he didn't seem to be in sync necessarily with the government's views on Brexit and perhaps it was better for him to go. But on the other side, uh, Remain campaigners have been regretting his departure. They say there's been a huge loss of experience. Uh, Sir Ivan Rogers had worked for the Vice President of the European Commission in the past, for example. Some people felt he was too close to Brussels, but he certainly knew how uh, Brussels worked. Um, and uh, we also heard from the former head of the Foreign Office, the former head of the Diplomatic Service, uh, Sir Simon Fraser this morning. He too thinks that uh, Ivan Rogers will be a great loss just several months before Theresa May is due to press the button on Article 50, the process of leaving the European Union. And he suggested that uh, one of the reasons that Ivan Rogers had left is because his advice simply wasn't being listened to in Downing Street. I think what comes through in that note is a certain frustration from Ivan Rogers about the way that the negotiating position has so far been coordinated in London and the extent to which advice from the experts in Brussels uh, is being included in that. So uh, that does come through and I think what is important is that by the time we trigger Article 50 we have clarity about the objectives and the purpose of the negotiation. Uh, how much of a problem is this for Mrs May and for Downing Street? Well, I think uh, obviously having to replace your senior EU representative at this point is not something that's desirable, uh, but you know, we'll have to get on with it. The Prime Minister will have to go ahead. There will be a selection process involving the Foreign Office, the Foreign Secretary, the Cabinet Secretary and the Prime Minister to find someone who's qualified and able to take over from Ivan. And I think that is one of the problems that's been highlighted there by the former head of the Foreign Office, uh, Sir Simon Fraser, is the, the process and the timescale for the replacement. The clock is ticking. Theresa May has already said that Article 50 has to be uh, invoked before the end of March. And yet, from my conversations this morning, there isn't a clear process in place for finding a replacement to Sir Ivan Rogers. Now, one of the key jobs he did was effectively meet representatives from all the other EU member states formally every single week. That he was in Brussels informally, probably even more regularly. So in terms of getting that intelligence from Brussels, what they might be up to, what the other countries might be up to, is vitally important. Uh, so far, it looks as though it might be a recommendation from a senior civil servant as to who his successor should be. Uh, but the fact that no timetable, uh, Victoria, no timescale is in place uh, for his replacement suggests that it was indeed quite a surprise to Downing Street uh, that he left at this stage, even though he was due to stand down before the end of the year. So I think that will be a challenge for Theresa May, but the bigger challenge, the bigger political challenge for her is to answer the central accusation, if you like, in his resignation letter that it isn't simply that the government 
won't give us a running commentary on Brexit, won't share the details of the negotiating strategy with us, but quite simply, they don't yet know what their objectives are when they go into those crucial negotiations with the rest of the EU. Thank you very much, Ian, for the moment. Ian Watson reporting live from Westminster. Let's bring up until yesterday, the UK's ambassador to the EU was a man called Sir Ivan Rogers. But then he resigned, which was a surprise, not least because the UK starts its talks for exiting the European Union when Article 50 is triggered, which, you all know, will be the end of March. And Sir Ivan, an experienced negotiator, was expected to play a part in that. Overnight, an email he wrote to his staff explaining why he'd stepped down referred to muddled thinking. It also spoke of ill-founded arguments, and he urged his staff to speak truth to power, which sort of implies that the advice he'd been giving to Downing Street had fallen on deaf ears. So what does all this mean for Brexit negotiations, which will start in the next couple of months? Let's speak to Conservative MP Anne-Marie Trevelyan, who voted for Britain to leave the European Union, and in Darlington is Labour's spokesperson on Brexit, Jenny Chapman, who voted to remain. Welcome, both of you. Um, did he jump Anne-Marie Trevelyan or was he pushed? Well, having had the chance to read uh, the email you refer to overnight, it seems to me that as you know, a man who's been in this game for a very long time, uh, he understands that what will be most useful and helpful for the Prime Minister as she uh, triggers Article 50 and then has a two-year negotiation process is to have someone who will be play in place for that whole cycle. Now, he was due to retire in October. Uh, his number two, Sean Morgan, uh, d uh, had uh, already said that she would be leaving the team to go and work for the Welsh Government. So I think he's seen that looking forward, the best thing uh, that Theresa May uh, could have at her disposal for these discussions is a full team who will be there for the two-year duration. Wasn't he expected to have his contract extended? I'm sure, that, sure that's not the right terminology for the <laughs> diplomatic <laughs> service. but. Uh, well, that's not something he's mentioned. I, th I think talking to colleagues, uh, the view was that he had been in post for a while uh, and that you know he, he planned to have, you know, whether he's retiring or going back into the private sector, I have no idea. Uh, but I think uh, his, his message is very clear that he wanted to see uh, a team in place who will be able to drive forwards that what will be a complex and uh, detailed discussion over the next two years. OK, let's bring in Jenny Chapman and you can talk to her as well, Anne-Marie Trevelyan. So it, according to Anne-Marie, it, it was a, a very sensible decision and he took it in advance of his retirement so that Theresa May can get the full team in place? Well that isn't what he said and he made it very very clear in his email that he's deeply troubled by the way that the negotiations look as though they may be carried out. Uh, he, you know, he could not have been more uh, sort of straightforward really, it's been quite transparent in his email that he thinks that there's muddled thinking, that he thinks that the government doesn't have a plan and now we find the government has no plan and that it has one less experienced, well-connected person to help Britain get what it needs out of Brexit. So this is, it's bad news, there's no putting a shine on it um, and, you know, the whole situation is deeply worrying. Well, I think um, I would disagree with Jenny. I think the start of his, his letter is very clear that he feels that Sean's departure and his own fit with what the Prime Minister will need, which is a full team. But I agree with you that he, he talks about muddled thinking. And certainly as someone who was uh, watching and hoping when he was leading the discussions with the former Prime Minister, David Cameron, in February to get us a really good deal. And I was hopeful that if there was a really good deal, we wouldn't need to leave because we would have a new relationship. And that failed and that deal just didn't make the progress. But I think what he, he highlighted in his letter is that the, the Whitehall really hadn't uh, driven forwards. I was shocked to discover when we got to the other side of Brexit that Whitehall just hadn't prepared for what was a 50-50 chance, to be honest, of out or in, that Whitehall just had assumed that the British people would stay in. Uh, and that, for me, was very muddled thinking in Whitehall. And I think he has, you know, tried and perhaps has decided that a new team need to, to take that on. I was, I was quite, you know, unsurprised by those words. But I think they reflect a Whitehall view that now needs to change. Our civil servants really need and are coming together with Theresa May's three new departments. Jenny Chapman, do you think do you think the muddled thinking was referring to, to civil servants or to the Prime Minister and those around her? Well, what I think is that, you, I think what Anne-Marie just said is incredibly candid, and I, I agree with her, but you can't just say Whitehall has a job of preparing for the possibility of a leave vote. You know, the government should have required the civil service to do that work prior to the referendum. There was a very long lead-in to the referendum. They had ample opportunity to do that, and the government just failed to preempt this outcome. So I think it's negligence, frankly, on behalf of the government. 
And what we have now is an incredibly difficult task in Brexit. You know, it's one that we must undertake seriously and carefully. And we need our best negotiators, our best friends doing this. And everybody who's had anything to do with Ivan Rogers, including George Osborne, has been incredibly complimentary about his skills and experience and his, his networks across Europe. That would have been a huge asset. We now have lost that asset, but you know, we now need to move forward and the government really has to do much, much better in the way that it approaches Brexit. It's okay. not been a very good start and we're now seven months in. You know, we should be much further forward, we should have much more clarity and I think you know, British people are getting a bit fed up with the lack of information and this is just another case of the government not dealing with Brexit as well as it should. All right. Thank you both. Thank you very much for coming on the programme. Uh, Jenny Chapman, who is the Shadow Brexit Minister, and uh, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, a uh, Conservative MP, who voted to leave. Thank you. As resignation letters go, this one pulled no punches. In a leaked email to colleagues, Sir Ivan Rogers, who's quit as Britain's top EU diplomat, has accused the government of muddled thinking over its Brexit plans. But Leave campaigners argue that those forthright views are precisely the reason Sir Ivan could no longer be trusted. The resignation has set off a heated row over the role of the civil service in the tough negotiations ahead. Here's our diplomatic correspondent, James Landale. Sir Ivan Rogers, here on the right, was our man in Brussels. The seasoned diplomat with the ear of prime ministers past and present. But now he's gone, attacking Theresa May's government for its muddled thinking about Brexit. And former colleagues say, his loss will be great only months before negotiations begin. His resignation at this particular point, just before the triggering of Article 50, is a shame because he's a man of great experience and expertise and knowledge uh, who would be very useful for the government. I think it's a blow because he was a hugely experienced, professional, dedicated um, public servant. Um, he was a really good diplomat, but he also had that real insight into how the EU worked. Sir Ivan's job was to be Theresa May's eyes and ears at the negotiations in Brussels. But in an outspoken resignation email, he revealed that even he was being kept out of the loop, saying, we do not yet know what the government will set as negotiating objectives for the UK's relationship with the EU after exit. That plan is being kept hidden, or at least is still being prepared, behind closed doors in Downing Street. Foreign Secretary, was he pushed to resign? Hi. Who's going to replace oh, him? Ministers today refuse to give, yes, a running commentary or at least take any questions off their script. In terms of our preparations for Brexit, we absolutely have the right resources. For months, Sir Ivan helped David Cameron try to reform the EU ahead of the referendum, traipsing fruitlessly between London and Brussels. But he said in his letter that his new political masters were not prepared for the even bigger talks ahead. Serious multilateral negotiating experience, he said, was in short supply in Whitehall. The structure of the UK's negotiating team needs rapid resolution. The government, he added, should listen more to British officials in Brussels and make a stronger case for the importance of a trade deal with the EU. Saying, contrary to the beliefs of some, free trade does not just happen when it is not thwarted by authorities. Brexit MPs said this all confirmed that Sir Ivan was too pessimistic about leaving the EU and he was right to go. The email was verging on the pompous really in the sense that it was an awful lot about him and a lot about, you know, truth as though everything he said to the government was almost chiselled in, in tablets of stone. As we go into what is an incredibly important negotiation, we should have somebody leading for the UK who clearly believes that the outcome can be beneficial to the UK. But there were warnings against any attempt to politicise the civil service. We're creating an atmosphere where anyone who does not simply parrot the view of a certain political group is seen to be getting in the way of Brexit. And that is not what civil servants are there to do. The charge from Sir Ivan Rogers is a serious one. That the government is not ready for the discussions about Brexit that are due within months. That it doesn't have a strategy or negotiating team in place. So as the Foreign Office here starts looking for a new ambassador, MPs are looking for answers about what the government's objectives are. And they're hoping Theresa May will provide some in a speech on Brexit expected soon. One she'll have to write without Sir Ivan Rogers at her shoulder in Brussels. James Landell, BBC News.
Well, joining me now from Downing Street is our deputy political editor, John Pina. John, since we've come on air just in the last few minutes, we're hearing that a new diplomat has been appointed. What more can you tell us? Well, George, we now know the new ambassador will be Sir Tim Barrow. He is a, a senior official at the Foreign Office, a former Moscow ambassador, a man who's done time in Brussels in his career, and also someone who Downing Street will hope they can have a smoother uh, relationship with than they did with Ivan Rogers. Still some tricky questions, though, George, uh, still facing the, the government, because the Rogers resignation highlighted some tensions. More uh, departments are involved, more widely than just the Foreign Office, tensions between very senior officials in some cases and key ministers. And those officials believe that those ministers simply don't understand or won't admit the true complexity of the Brexit question. Now, to key Brexiteers, it's about loyalty and faith. And that's a red rag to a bull to a lot of civil servants who say they don't take sides, they take orders and make them work. Why does it matter? Well, as if this negotiation coming up wasn't difficult and complex enough, there are tensions underlying it all between officials, senior officials and senior ministers, as well as a continuing resentment between Remainers and Brexiteers, although that civil war was done and dusted about half a year ago. Uh, John, on the original resignation, no official reaction yet from, from Dan. See, what kind of arguments do you think have been going on behind that door? Well, for, for Theresa May, this is not about an ideological con, uh, uh, conviction about Brexit. It's about making the plan work. The problem is there is no clear plan yet. Now, we are promised a, a significant speech by the Prime Minister in coming weeks to address some of the detail of Brexit. And it may, it just may, clear some of the pressure on Theresa May to give more detail and provide more clarity. But given that she wants to keep her cards closed and her options open, frankly, George, I wouldn't hold your breath. All right, John, thank you very much. So in the last hour, the Foreign Office has confirmed that Britain has a new ambassador to the EU just a day after Sir Ivan Rogers suddenly resigned from the job. Theresa May has appointed another career diplomat, Sir Tim Barrow, to take over the post. But Sir Ivan's sudden departure is still making waves in Whitehall. Tonight, his friends have told this programme he believed his position was being deliberately undermined by Theresa May's senior aides in Downing Street. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is in Westminster. Gary. Well, number 10 will be hoping that they've achieved something today in getting an appointment, a new appointment, very quickly. They hope they can draw a line under this with the appointment of Sir Tim uh, Barrow to the job that was uh, suddenly vacated. And they hope they can stop the appearance of uh, headless chicken style uh, uh, government and, and chaos. And they think that what they've come up with as well, which they're pleased about, is a name that uh, just about everyone is uh, in the middle of government is happy to sign off on. Uh, I'm told that uh, uh, Boris Johnson was pretty thrilled about the appointment, Brexiteer, of course. David Davis, Secretary of State for, Brexiting the, uh, for Brexit, for uh, leaving the EU, uh, he was uh, happy and was consulted. I'm told Liam Fox was uh, informed. I think there's a nuance uh, there. Uh, and the only people who are seriously upset properly uh, uh, around the Conservative Party are those uh, who are staunch Brexiteers, I suppose you might call them, who'd been toying with the idea of maybe we could have a, a business person come in, in, into this job or parachute in a politician uh, who was an ardent Brexiteer. What do we know about the man who's taking over this job, Sir, Sir Tim Barrow? Well, uh, one person from Whitehall I spoke to who has an acquaintance with him said he thought he was uh, a, a Remainer like most people in the Foreign Office, but not a Ramona. One diplomat I spoke to who knows him quite well described him as tiggerish and irrepressible. Not, he went on to say, words you would use to describe Sir Ivan Rogers. But it is Sir Ivan Rogers and the uh, reasons around his departure that have still been dominating today. A man with uh, extraordinary uh, contacts and expertise on Europe who nonetheless has gone. And people have still been wondering today, why did he go? In a farewell email to his staff at the UK's office in Brussels, Sir Ivan Rogers underlines the black hole his disappearance creates in the UK's Brexit negotiating team. Sir Ivan writes, Serious multilateral negotiating experience is in short supply in Whitehall, and that is not the case in the European Commission or the European Council. Sir Ivan then exhorts his former colleagues to challenge ill-founded arguments and muddled thinking and never be afraid to speak truth to those in power. Well, this will be a very serious gap. Ivan Rogers is the most experienced Europeanist left in the British civil service. He's someone with a real track record of working in Brussels, knowing how those arcane negotiations work. 
And without him, we don't really have anyone at the senior ranks left who can do that. Rather petulant, I thought, the release of this email, this long-winded email full of I, me, you know, speaking truth to power, really rather pompous, really. All of that tells me that this individual probably wasn't really trusted. Headlines warning it could take 10 years to finish a Brexit deal with Europe popped up just as Theresa May pulled up at last month's Brussels summit. They were the trigger for this resignation. Someone had leaked an earlier Ivan Rogers email to the PM warning EU leaders thought a new relationship wouldn't be finalised until the mid-2020s. Someone wanted to portray Sir Ivan as a footbragger. Friends of Sir Ivan Rogers say he is 100% convinced that the Prime Minister's two most senior aides in number 10 were behind the leaking of his email. And he believes they did it to damage him and in the hope he would walk early from his job. In number 10, they say, the Prime Minister wouldn't have wanted headlines like this on her way into the Brussels summit. And you can tell that from the fact she didn't want to talk about them. Do you think it could take 10 years to negotiate a trade deal once Britain leaves the EU? Well, what we'll be discussing at this summit is how we work together to deal with the serious challenges that we face. It's always hard to know where leaks have come from, so you have to look at in whose interest is the leak. And I think pretty clearly there, it's in the interest of someone who wanted to undermine our man in Brussels. Um, and what they need most of all now from the civil servants is fearless, unvarnished advice about the opportunities, but also the risks and the difficulties. And, and if when you send that into London you find it's leaked and then you know, you're pilloried around town, that doesn't do anything for confidence. In his message to staff in his old Brussels office, Sir Ivan pleads with them not to follow him out the door. I understand quite a few officials out there might have been giving that some thought. Sir Ivan also takes a swipe at those around Whitehall who believe you can move just like that from EU membership to free trade. His message to them is that you need free trade agreements to underpin any free trade that isn't smuggling, and they take time. That, I understand, reflects an argument that Ivan Rogers has had quite a few times in private with the Secretary of State for exiting the EU, David Davis. David Davis himself signed off on the Ivan Rogers pretty instant replacement, the man who'll be at Theresa May's elbow the next time she goes to Brussels and at the centre now of the Brexit talks. Gary Gibbon reporting. Well, we did, of course, ask to speak to the relevant government ministers, but no one was available. Uh, with me is Labour's shadow Brexit secretary, Keir Starmer, and the Conservative MP and Brexit supporter, Dominic Raab. Um, you want David Davis, who's the, the Brexit man you're uh, up against, uh, to come to Parliament to explain what's been going on? Yes, I've asked him to come to Parliament and to make a statement because we've got the fact of Sir Ivan's um, resignation, and I'm glad there's been an appointment made in the last hour or so. Um, but then there are the underlying reasons that he set out. And in particular, I think, the concern that he says there's no uh, negotiating objectives agreed yet um, and that the team isn't properly resourced, the negotiating EU team, um, and structures and roles haven't been organised. Now, obviously, it takes a bit of time to get this done, but we're now 10 to 11 weeks away. So I think um, the government's actually been silent on this, apart from, as I say, the fact of the resignation, the substance of the charge needs to be answered. And I think David Davis needs to come to Parliament and reassure not just the opposition and Parliament, but the country, that there actually is a plan, um, they do know what they're doing, um, and that they've got the right structures and teams in place, because time is running out. Well, one of the problems is that Sir Ivan's letter seems to indicate, or email, uh, seems to suggest that there's a grave absence of a plan. Well, I think this is real... I mean, we've been pressing for a plan for some months. Now, I am sympathetic to the argument that the government needs to get this right, there are difficult judgment calls, but we're now in January, uh, we've got weeks left. There has to be a plan. We're not even in the territory of whether it should be disclosed. There's a basic question. Do you actually know now what your negotiating objectives are? And that's why David Davis really has to come to the House and answer that question. But there is a profound difficulty, isn't there? I mean, there is an institution, the Foreign Office, who has been charged with trying to make the, foreign, to make, make the European Union work in Brit Britain's interests for four decades, and now suddenly being asked to unpick it. It's hardly surprising there's a bit of a hiccup on the way. Well, I, I, I wouldn't describe this as a hiccup along <laughs> the way. I mean, this resignation coming as it does weeks before the negotiations start. But there is a deeper issue here. Um, when I was Director of Public Prosecutions, I had to make difficult decisions. I needed challenge, and the civil service and the excellent civil service advice helped make good decisions. And I think it's a great shame if there's any sense of pushing to one side 
those that would want to put in relevant and robust challenge to what any government wants to do. We've got to be very careful on this. Do you have confidence in the appointment uh, of Sir Tim? Yeah, I think he's an interesting choice. He's a criminologist by background, having been ambassador to Russia and the Ukraine, and that's probably about the right skill set to taking on and going into bat with Brussels. His reputation as well is one of a fixer, uh, not particularly weighed down by the kind of EU institutional position that the, that, that the Foreign Office is reputed to have, right, you're wrong. Although he's worked very happily in it. In some of the aspects like security and, and, and certain other areas, but that's not his. That's not been his bread and butter for X number of years. My my view is actually it's a a, a savvy appointment. He'll bring mm. some fresh thinking. And actually, what we now need to do is row behind the Brexit team because what everyone wants to see watching this show is uh, a united team delivering for the Brit for so the whole country. You see him therefore as a man with a plan. Well, you don't expect your ambassador in Brussels to be the one to come up with a plan, but the truth is we already know a huge amount about what Britain wants to achieve. It wants to give effect to the referendum. Oh, no, we all know what they want to achieve, but we have no idea what on earth the plan is for achieving it. Well, and well, neither go, do you. Well, I, I, I know very clearly, because the Prime Minister set out, that we're going to take back control over um, immigration. We're not going to be subject to free movement rules. We want to be a global leader in free mm. trade, so that means we don't want the EU negotiating our mm. free trade agreements. We said we're coming out of the ECJ jurisdiction, but as Keir said, and everyone knows, you don't disclose the detail of your hand before the two years of Brexit poker has even got underway. Well, you don't lose your man on the job the, the moment just before he's about to get on with it. Uh, and, and why, why should we have any confidence at all that poor Sir Tim Barrow, Barrow won't go the same way? Well, the remarkable thing about what you've shown and what Sir Keir said so far is that you've not mentioned the two reasons that in his letter, which I have here, um, Sir Ivan gave for stepping down. Yes, he, he said... He actually indicates very strongly he, he does, was pushed no, out by number 10. No, he doesn't say he that. He does. If you read between the lines, you've got ah, a lot. So you want to read between the lines. I'll take it at face value. He says, first of all, I was stepping down in October anyway. Shouldn't the person who completes the Brexit negotiations also begin then? Well, look, and that's been the case for months, and that could have been fixed ages ago. Somebody could have said uh, that's what's so, going to happen. So, John, no such you're thing not happened. disputing the politicians. You're saying that... Actually, he's not being straight. No, no, no. It's perfectly obvious that that was not the okay. decision. So what he says, reason one, I think the person that begins the negotiations should complete them. Reason two is that my deputy and his deputy or the next ambassador, uh, 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 Sir Tim's deputy, uh, uh, ought to be in place and the new ambassador who's going to see the negotiations through should have a hand in picking the deputy so you don't have uh, well, divisions between... The you've had six months to sort that out. It wasn't me done because there was no plan. It was his choice. I, I, I'm wondering what you make of this. Well, Dominic is tiptoeing around the real issue, which is there isn't a plan. It isn't good enough anymore to simply have four or five half sentences um, that are pretty meaningless as a, as a set of objectives. Uh, and if the negotiating team um, don't even at this stage know the objectives, that is a very serious concern. There's the secondary question of what can be put into the public domain. I think the government can and should say, what's their basic position? on the single market? What's the basic position on the customs union? Are they in favour of paying in? And if so, how much? Are they in favour of transitional arrangements? These are big ticket items. They must have well, answers. It goes up, but that's a very yeah, simple so question. Not the single market. So, Where are you on single so, market? So, so Why John, don't they say? So, John, let me answer in my terms. First of all, I've given you the two reasons that Sir Ivan gave. Up front, first page of the letter. Secondly, on coming to the House of Commons, I'm surprised Keir wants to come to the House of Commons. Every time he does, the splits on the Labour side are much greater than on the Tory side. 23 rebelled against Jeremy Corbyn's position. Keir but, wants to see the free movement rules ripped up. He's not got the backing well, of the Labour Party. Honestly, Dominic, with, with 11 or 12 weeks to go, to start pointing to the opposition, the real negotiations for the future of this country are about to begin. That is a huge responsibility on the government, and it's no good you simply pointing at anybody else. Come up with the I'm, answers. We're, there, I'm, there, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it. Kirsten Ke Starman, Dominic Rabb, thank you very much indeed for coming in. We watch this space. OK. There is nothing like an angry resignation to lift the lid on a simmering political argument. But even so, Sir Ivan Rogers, our former ambassador to the EU, had some punchy things to say today. There were none too subtle digs at various ministers. But most startling of all in his resignation email was this slime. We do not yet know what the government will set as negotiating objectives for the UK's relationship with the EU after exit. Well, that's no big deal, you may say, except that this was the man who was supposed to be orchestrating our exit in only a few months' time. Was he, in fact, saying that even at this late stage, that actually is 
no plan. Either way, his resignation email prompted some withering put-downs from pro-Brexit Conservatives. He had just got too big for his boots, they said. His replacement has been quickly ushered into place. He is Sir Tim Barrow, another experienced diplomat who, number 10 says, will make a success of Brexit. Sitting at the right hand of the Foreign Secretary, a man with whom he's said to get on well, Sir Tim Barrow will now pick up the baton of leading Britain's exit negotiations in Brussels. Significantly, he is a career diplomat, not a political appointment, as some Brexiters had urged. Sir Tim has spent his 30-year career at the Foreign Office, including two spells in Brussels, before rising to become Britain's ambassador to Moscow. Just last year, he came back to London as political director at the Foreign Office. No one doubts his credentials or his ability. He was appointed with such haste because of the need to end the row about last night's parting email from the outgoing ambassador, Sir Ivan Rogers. In it, he described a Brexit process built on ill-founded arguments, marked by muddled thinking, and in which it was essential that civil servants speak the truth to ministers. What those ministers thought about this, they steadfastly weren't saying. Sir Ivan's direct boss, Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, returning from an early morning run, uncharacteristically silent. Foreign Secretary, was he pushed to resign? Hi. Who's going to replace Hi. him? He left it instead to hardline Brexiters to attack a man they had never trusted. I have a very simple point to make over this, which is civil servants advise, governments decide, uh, and this particular civil servant, I think, had got perhaps a little bit too big for his boots. Perhaps most damning, Sir Ivan revealed that six months after the referendum, the government still has no plan. It's not that they're not telling us, it's that they don't know. We do not yet know what the government will set as negotiating objectives for the UK's relationship with the EU after exit, he wrote. Something that those who've been at the top of the civil service find astonishing. The most worrying thing of all is the suggestion that he, as our ambassador to the EU, two months away from a negotiation we ourselves are triggering, did not know what our objectives were in those negotiations. If we're seriously entering into the most important negotiations in my lifetime without knowing what our objectives are, we are in really serious trouble. Labour have welcomed the swift move to fill Sir Ivan's shoes, but they point out this is much more than a row about personnel. It's really important that we have someone of real quality in place. The problem, I think, is it doesn't take away the underlying issues because what Sir Ivan was flagging up is that there's not a negotiating plan yet um, and that the team, the EU team, is not properly resourced or structured. Those questions remain. And until ministers do decide what it is they're going to be asking for in these negotiations, the new man, Sir Tim Barrow, will be no better equipped than the old one was. James Mates, News at 10. It is, of course, very hard to know what is normal at this point, since few of us have ever lived through a negotiation this complex. But one man who might have an idea is Lord Hannay, a former civil servant who was a key player in the talks that took us into the EU, or the economic community as it then was, and who helped lead the negotiations that delivered Margaret Thatcher's famous rebate. I started by asking him why he thought Sir Ivan had resigned. I think the tone of the, uh, of the communication he made to his staff does look like someone who made up his own mind uh, that he was being asked to do uh, impossible things, mainly impossible because he didn't know what he was being asked to do. You've done many, many negotiations. Uh, he got into trouble for suggesting this was going to take 10 years. What's your own estimation for how long this might take? I wouldn't put a figure on it. Uh, I don't think it's knowable at this stage. All I would say but is... You wouldn't that say 10 years was ridiculous? Or... No, I certainly wouldn't say it's ridiculous. And I would say, and that's the only figure I would put uh, on any advice I was to give now, is it can't be done in two years. Brexit was a surprise, he says, and he doesn't blame the government for taking its time, but... Uh, I am beginning to think that they're cutting it very fine with the end March deadline, with the commitment now to produce a plan for Parliament, and with as yet still no sign whatsoever that they've got uh, clear objectives in their mind. Nobody's asking them to put the details of their negotiating hand on the table. That is a completely misleading representation. But people in Parliament, uh, and I'm one of those, uh, really are asking for a clear statement of what they're aiming to do.
What did you make of, of the overall tone of the letter and what it said about the state of relationships between civil servants and politicians at this point? Uh, I don't want to draw any general conclusions because I'm not in, involved in, in, in the inside. If I was, I would draw some general conclusions. Uh, the only one that does strike me is that it reveals a very high uh, a degree of tension around. When people write uh, communications like that, it's because they're under great stress. It's not, civil servants don't naturally write things like that. Uh, so I think it's a bad sign, frankly. I think it's a sign that there is great stress within the machine and that part of this stress is being created by the absence of uh, any sense of real guidance as to what we're trying to do. Former Ambassador Lord Hannay talking to me uh, earlier. Well, our deputy political editor, Chris Shipp, uh, is here. Um, what did you, I mean, you, you probably heard Lord Hannay there saying that he wasn't yeah. sure at this point that there was a, a plan. There must be a plan, surely. Well, I suppose that the, the news I have to deliver you, to you is I don't really think there is. I think that's probably what's at the, the heart of all this. I mean, I had an interesting chat with a civil servant from the Foreign Office before Christmas, before any of this. Mm -hmm resignation uh, blew up and he said to me then look you know we've got so much work to do but we can't actually get on with the work that he's done because we don't know which direction we're traveling take the the customs union for example if we're going to leave the customs union then we've got to do this body of work if we're going to stay in the customs union we've got to do this body of work but at the moment we can't do any of it because the direction from from number 10 isn't there and I think that's sort of the point that Lord Hannay was mentioning mm -hmm. there at the end that there doesn't seem to be a plan or if there is one Theresa May is keeping it so close to her chest that nobody can actually read it. Okay so Sir Ivan has gone, Sir Tim has come in, yes. one civil servant gives way to another what's the difference in your view between these two men? I think the crucial difference is that uh, this one will get on with the Foreign Secretary. Um, they're both career civil servants. Sir so, so Tim Barrow has been in the civil service for, for 30 years. He's been former ambassador to Moscow and to, and to the Ukraine. He, he's been around a, a, a lot. But unlike his, his predecessor, Boris Johnson's sort of given his approval today, so has David Davis, the Brexit minister. I spoke to Ian Duncan Smith on the phone earlier. He's quite happy uh, with it as well. So I think that's the point uh, of difference. But again, we're talking here about Theresa May's operating mm -hmm. style. And the job of a civil servant is to go up, say you're the, 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 the minister, is to go up to you and say, this is the truth. This is the unvarnished truth. You've got to be able to speak to them in a very sort of you know, basic way. And there's a worry here that Theresa May doesn't like this sort of advice. Well, but isn't, isn't it also a bit weird? I mean, the civil servant is supposed to be strictly impartial. And we've got sort of Brexiteers sort of, I mean, I don't know where they shoved this guy, but mm. Sir Ivan leaves the stage with a heavy push at his back, got a new guy coming in who they apparently approve of. I didn't think this was supposed to be how civil service appointments operated. Yeah, well, the, the civil service, which goes back to what the, the, the mid 19th century, is meant to operate independently of ministers. And actually, Ian Duncan Smith made the point there that civil servants advise, ministers decide. Now, it could be that, that this particular civil servant wasn't doing what, wasn't carrying out the decisions. Because if you're a civil servant, like it or not, you've got to carry out the, the decisions. It could be that he wasn't doing that, and that's why the government and he himself thought he should go. He could have gone quietly, but look at the size of that email. He, he, he decided <laughs> yeah. not to go quietly. That Certainly, I don't choice. think that counts as going quietly. Um, Chris, thank you very much uh, indeed. I've been getting away with it all.